kingdom of us. Amen. Yes, and help us to heed every warning that you have given us. Yes. yes. Especially regarding this matter of death. Amen. Oh Lord, may we not give any more room to death. Amen. Amen. Fully defeated by your victorious life. Amen. Amen. Fill us all with your resurrection life. Amen. 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 Speak to us again yeah. so practically in your words. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, we do not just desire the knowledge. We right. want yeah. the experience and the reality. Yeah. 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 Lord, write this word on our hearts and on our minds. Yeah. Lord, that it would be lived out and confirmed in us. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yes, we pray that your word would be spirit and life. Amen. Oh Lord, strengthen us that we would all choose life. Amen. To overcome death. Amen. Oh Lord, that we could press on towards the goal. Amen. Continue to unveil us and open our eyes. Amen. To see our real condition. Amen. Oh Lord, take us on Lord. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. <clears throat> yeah, well, actually, before we uh, touch this matter regarding the matter, of, uh, and as many have testified and many have confirmed the word last night, it's very good to see if we want to be perfected in the holy and royal priesthood, then we need an example. <laughs> the Lord is our wonderful example, and he's provided everything that we need to reach the goal, to reach perfection, to be kings and priests. It's so wonderful to see such an example, right? And, and a prayer is with many of us, and our prayer is, Lord, raise us all up to also be faithful examples for our children, for one another, that we could be built up as this holy and royal priesthood, right? <clears throat> but as we... Some of us may have read the verses this morning. Uh, I know Mo had a couple of verses out, but let's turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And let's start with verse 12. And let's read all the way till we get to verse 18. Okay? Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. And let's all read it together. And as you read it, consider the Lord. This is a description, a depiction of the Lord also as his glorious great high priest. Yes. So as you read it, read it with this consideration. Yeah. Okay, let's read it together. Then, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one lamp with a golden band, and his head and hair were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like the flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Praise the Lord. Amen. Some of you were in the year-end conference when we were in Revelation chapters 1 through 3. And we should see that in these first three chapters, the Lord is also giving us last-minute instructions as this glorious great high priest. How do we know that this is a description 
of a great high priest. Because right? I know I've read this passage many times throughout my Christian life. And, but we have to see there's a context here. Where would you find the Son of Man walking or standing in the midst of the golden lampstands? Where is that setting? In the sanctuary. In the holy place. And the one who enters into the sanctuary can only be the great high priest. Sanctuary in the temple. Right. In the sanctuary, in the temple. Right. So this first three chapters of Revelation is in the context of the priesthood. And this is very consistent because all through Revelation, as we said from the very beginning, what does the Lord want us to become? What does he want us to make us into? Kings. Kings and priests. Very good. So then, why would this not be in the context of the priesthood? So we now see the Lord in a different light. <laughs> it's such a strong impression that John fell at his feet as dead. Right? Last night we saw this merciful and faithful high priest. Very loving, caring, praying for us, supplying us all our needs. But you have to realize the love of the high priest also comes with judgment. And in this description of the Lord, you can see the Lord as this high priest and his coming is for judgment. Very simple. Chapters 2 and 3, he speaks without mincing any words. He gets right to the point. He tells you what he loves. And more importantly, he tells you what he hates. Mm -hmm. If we want to be qualified, would you only want to hear about what he loves? Or would you also want to hear what he hates? I think as a parent, do you like to discipline your children? Uh, I see. No. <laughs> yeah, we love our children. We want to provide them with everything that they need. Right? We don't want to have any, you know, conflicts, so to say. But as parents, we know that we still need to discipline our children. At least I hope we have that desire to do that. And so we have to see here that the Lord as the great high priest, Revelation tells us the time is very close. And if the time is very close and he still sees things that are not yet perfected in us, then he's going to tell us, tell it to you straight up. Vince, I love this. And Vince, I hate this. And we need this. Otherwise, what kind of a high priest do we have? And when you consider this, right, you know, the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about his chest with a golden band. Right? This is the description of the garment, the clothing that the high priest is wearing, right, to enter in. His head and hair were like white, like wool, as white as snow. God's righteousness, God's wisdom is there. And his eyes like a flame of fire. What's a flame of fire there for? <laughs> to, to expose. To judge it. Right? And his feet were like fine brass. This is the judgment. As if refined in paradise. <laughs> what does yours say, Nelson? <laughs> refined in the fire. In the furnace. Is a furnace paradise? <laughs> Is it a nice place to be in? It's a lot of heat. Why? We need the heat to pure, be purified. The impurity needs to be burned out of us. His voice as the sound of many waters. He's really trying to get our attention. And are we listening? 
And he had in his right hand seven stars, or the seven messengers. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. What is this two-edged sword for? To divide of the soul and spirit. To know, to discern of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And the Lord is judging. He wants to perfect us. And then it says, and his countenance was like sun shining in its strength. And not only is he judging us, you have to realize the sun is also for the healing. So this is who John saw. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Right? Do we also have this view of the Lord in such a way? He wants us to get ready. BJ, he wants you to be ready. Would you rather have him tell you nice flowery things? Oh, BJ, you're so nice. You're so good. You can play the piano. You're good with the kids. Is that all you want to hear? That's not what I need. That's not what you need. You like to hear it. We all like to hear that. But that is not what we need. What we need to know is what we are still short in. And this is what, and this should be our prayer. As I, as I shared earlier, each day when you wake up, are we asking the Lord, Lord, what else still needs to be perfected in me? And perfected in the family and in the church life and in the priesthood. What else is still lacking? Because the Lord is warning us. He wants us to get ready. Right? If you go back to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Speaks about his discipline. In verse 5 it says. And you have forgotten the exhortation. Which speaks to you as to sons. My son do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Nor be discouraged. When you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves. He chastens. And scourges every son whom he receives. Right? This is normal. Calvin, do you like to discipline Jacob when he does something wrong? Do you, you don't like to, but you have to. Why? Why do you have to? Yes. And you're doing it because you love him. Right? If you saw other kids at school running around doing terrible things, are you going to go and discipline them? <laughs> Right, if actually if you try to, you might get in trouble yeah. in this day and age. But because Jacob is your son, you love him. And you don't want him to make those mistakes, you will discipline him. This is love, brothers and sisters. Don't forget that love includes discipline. Right? Not to scold out of anger, right? But to discipline. Out of the love. We're disciplining. We're being disciplined by the love of God. Right? Why? Why does he need to do this? But if you're without chastening. Of which all have become partakers. Then you are illegitimate. And not sons. If we are not going to be willing to be. If we're not willing to be disciplined. Then we will not be qualified. To partake of the inheritance of the coming Millennial kingdom age. Right? And the writer goes on. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed are a few days, <clears throat> for a few days chasten us as seems best to them. But he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness and no chastening seems to be joyful for the present but painful nevertheless afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it those who have been trained right so this is what the lord 
as the great high priest wants to take care of us in this way in the last days, right? And it's good that there is the wonderful, bountiful supply and his interceding for us. We need that because we need his supply to be able to overcome and to take the chastening to be able to be perfected. But at the same time, he needs to chasten us, right? This is why when you get to the end of chapter 12 here, it says, therefore, since you are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God anyway, acceptably, with reverence and godly fear. For God, our God, is a consuming fire, right? God is a consuming fire. Why did the writer say God is a consuming fire? Do you know what referenced? Right. Aaron's sons. Right after they had the training, what did they do? They offered profane fire. And what did God do? He judged them by consuming them with fire and they were taken, eliminated right there. Because God cannot tolerate anything that is not holy. Right? So, this is our high priest. This is our glorious high priest. He wants us to reach the goal. Right? So we need to see the Lord in such a way. On the one hand, yes, he is merciful and he is faithful. And we praise the Lord that he is. Otherwise, we'd have no chance. And he accomplished everything for us. He's given everything for you. Jim, he's laid it all out for you. All you have to do is take, receive, and run with it. But at the same time, he wants to make sure you're qualified. And for that, he has to judge. This is why there is the judgment seat of Christ. But our prayer is that today he would judge us today and now. So that in that day, when we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, we would be able to receive the crown of righteousness. And he would say, good and faithful servant. Enter into, exactly, right? So we just wanted to, you know, round out the picture to see who the Lord is, right? This is... You know, this is who the Lord is, right? We have to have this view. Love includes not only the nourishing and the cherishing, but it also includes the discipline, the chastening. Right? And this is how we all can grow. And this is how we can be perfected. Amen? Amen. Okay, praise the Lord. So, this morning then, we come to this, this next point in the outline. Uh, this is regarding man's greatest hindrance. And this is the defilement of death. You know, we've been speaking about to be perfected in the priesthood. Now, one thing about the priesthood that we may not think or realize is, I'll read this verse to you. In Leviticus chapter 21, verse 1, it says this, And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests the sons of Aaron, and say to them, none shall defile himself from the dead among his people. Sorry, for the dead among his people. None shall defile himself for the dead among his people. So, why is this statement so strong, so important? It's because death is the worst of all defilements for the holy priesthood. Death is the most defiling. It is what will prevent us from being qualified to be the holy and royal priesthood. So, what is death? We have to consider this a little bit, right? Because if this is the worst defilement, we better find out what is death, right? If we go to Romans chapter 5, verse 19, 
It says, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. This is Romans 5.19. So one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. But then if you go back to verse 12, it also says, Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. In the outline, it was written for chapters 5 through 8. It gives you a very good description of what death is. By one man's offense, many died. By one man's offense, death reigned. The wages of sin is death. And then when you get to chapter 7, Paul was describing, you know, I want to do good, but I don't. I don't want to do evil, but I do. What's the problem here? Exactly. Paul said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now you might want to ask, well, what's the difference between a sinful man and a dead man? So what's the difference? <laughs> One is dead. Yes. But some might think sin, if you're a sinful man, you're a dead man. There's a distinction between the two. A sinful man is the one who will commit sin. He's still alive. I mean, he's not dead, but he has an opportunity to repent, to turn back, and to be forgiven. Right? But a dead man is what? Dead. <laughs> Nothing can change that dead man. And what's good for dead? To be buried. Right. That's a huge difference between a sinful man and a dead man. Right? We have to begin to realize, death is far more serious than being sinful. But of course, if we continue to sin, eventually we will become a dead man. <laughs> right? So, this is very important to see because the verses that we just read tells us already where dead death came from. Through one man's disobedience. If we go back to Genesis chapter 1, God put Adam and Eve in the garden. And he gave him one simple commandment, right? Partake of all of the fruits in the garden, except for the one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if you partake of it, you will surely die, right? One simple command. Easy enough, right, Nelson? You should be able to keep that command, right? You can eat of everything except for that one tree. If you eat that one tree, you will surely die. You can hold on. You, you can obey that, right? You think? Probably. Probably. Ooh. Oh, I don't know. Adam was created. He had no sin. And yet what happened? He disobeyed. What happened? Genesis chapter 3. Satan, God's enemy, came in to deceive man. And how did he deceive man? Yes, through the woman. But what technique did he use? <laughs> what technique did he use to deceive both Eve and Adam? He made you question God's word. Of course, then the woman was deceived. But here's the problem is, the first thing is, Satan made her question the word that God gave. And yes, through that, there was, she was deceived. And if we doubt God's word, the first characteristic of death is unbelief. You didn't believe God's word. And then, of course, the other part, which is, then they partook of the, they took of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
that is disobedience. But you know, disobedience is a very nice word of saying rebellion. So these two words, put it on your mind. Rebellion and unbelief. These are the two words you should always, the minute you see this coming your way, then you should realize this is going to lead to death. And if we are led to death, then we're not qualified. We disqualified us from being in the holy and royal priesthood. With Adam and Eve, what happened? They were disqualified from remaining in the Garden of Eden. They had to go. They could not come back anymore. Rebellion and unbelief will always result in death. Right? <clears throat> That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, in verse 21, it says, For since by man came death, and for as in Adam all died. Right? This is a very serious matter, brothers and sisters. And I'm actually thankful to the Lord. You know, this consideration of death as being a hindrance came out through the fellowship in the matter of the ashes of the red heifer. Right? We've been talking a lot about ashes of the red heifer as a sign that Israel will be soon able to offer up sacrifices. But what the Lord showed us is it's not just an outward sign, but it is a spiritual reality. Christ is the reality of the ashes of the red heifer. But before we can actually appreciate the ashes of the red heifer, we have to understand and see the extent of how much death resides in us. Right. One of the first examples was in 1 Samuel chapter 15. This one will just keep ringing in my mind. We won't read through it, but I'll just give you a, a rundown very quickly. 1 Samuel chapter 15 speaks about King Saul. And King Saul was given a command by the Lord God to, to go in and utterly destroy the Amalekites, both the people and the livestock. Everything should be utterly destroyed. And the king, of course. But what did Saul do? He spared the king and the livestock. Right. What Saul did was he accomplished maybe 80% of what God said. He utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but he spared the life of the king. And out of his good idea, he saw all these wonderful, the best of the livestock he saved. Because he thought it could be used for the offerings. Because he feared the people. He even feared the people, right? So, what was God's response? Was God very happy with Saul's actions? No, not at all. Not at all. Why? He, he, he utterly destroyed the people. But he still <laughs> saved the king. And then he even made an excuse for saving the livestock. Right. His good idea was to do this. Yeah. And then what happened to Saul for that? He lost the kingship. He lost the kingship. Yes. And eventually he lost his life. And Jonathan, his son, lost his life. Right. This is death. This is the result of disobedience. And towards the end of 1 Samuel 15, it even says this rebellion is what? Witchcraft. At the same level as witchcraft. Right? This is, for me, this was a, a very impactful picture. Because oftentimes, you know, the Lord tells us to do something. He'll say A, B, C, D. And we'll go, okay, yeah, we'll go, we'll do A, B, and C. But you know what? D is a little bit hard. Let me modify what God said, and then, and then I'll be fine. And then we change what God wants us to do. Do you think God will be pleased with that? No. Right? 
We live in a society today where if you're working, you're given a list of objectives and we like to just pick and choose what we want to accomplish. And the things that we don't, we kind of come up with a justification as to why it did it that way. I heard someone say, yeah. <laughs> Spoken in reality. This is really the case of society today. But how do you think the Lord would feel if we picked and choose what we want to obey? And then the rest, we just kind of lay it aside. Do you think we'll be qualified to become kings? No. Right? So rebellion and unbelief, we have to realize this tells us there's death still within our being. And we need to be purified from it. You know, it's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> in the outline, it also went on. Uh, it says, the appearance of death. I would encourage you, read Numbers chapter 11 through 18 on your own time. Because it gives you very, very detailed descriptions of how death was there amongst the children of Israel. In chapter 11, what was going on? They were complaining. <laughs> They've been wandering in the wilderness eating manna and they wanted meat. So they were complaining and murmuring. What did that result in? Death. Today, are we complaining and murmuring? Oh, why do I have to do this priesthood? Can't I just love God? And that's good enough? That's too hard. It's too hard. Too complicated. Complain, complain, complain. <laughs> right? And then, chapter 12, you have Miriam. And she's speaking against her younger brother Moses. Right. Dissension. She's questioning, why is, you know, Moses chosen by God to speak, Who be the leader? Who appointed you, right? <laughs> Right? When we do things like that, right? Okay, we may not be like Miriam, <laughs> but we might speak against one another in other matters. What is our conduct in speaking to one another? Yeah. Chapter 13, you have the 12 spies that went into the good land to check out the promised land. And they came back with a true report, right? They said, the land is good, flowing with milk and honey, just like what God promised us. But there are also giants. And we are like grasshoppers. And all of a sudden, they forgot what God has already done for them. And God would pave the way for them to take the good land. So their unbelief in their heart, they didn't enter in, right? Do we have a heart of unbelief? Do you think the Lord will make us first fruits? We need to have the confidence, the faith that the Lord will make us first fruits. If he wrote Revelation 14 describing the first fruits, that means he wrote it so that we can see that we can make it. But do we lack the faith to make it? Right? And then, of course, Korah. The rebellion with Korah, you can see how fast death spread. It wasn't just Korah, then it was the, what, 250, and then the whole tribe, they were swallowed up by the earth. But they eventually, death spread to many more. Thousands have died, right? This is the danger of death. This is the danger of death. Don't think that we cannot spread death very quickly. All it takes is one little comment from someone here or someone here, and then it's interpreted differently, and all of a sudden, talk to another person, talk to another person, and before you know, death has spread through a group of saints. Right. So this, brothers and sisters, we need to be exercised to see what the appearance of death is. What are the two words? Rebellion and unbelief, right? 
rebellion and unbelief. Right? So this is very serious. And this is what will disqualify us. Just as Saul was disqualified from the kingship, this would also disqualify us. Because death cannot be tolerated by God. And death for sure cannot be tolerated in the priesthood. Right? And so this is why we did want to spend a little bit of time to point this out. Because this is indeed our greatest hindrance. And this is why eventually you have Numbers 19. Numbers 19 then gives you the details of the ashes of the red heifer being used to purify, to purify the priests from any defilement of death. Right. <clears throat> we won't spend too much time in this meeting. Uh, when Toby arrives, he's going to spend some time to speak about overcoming Overcoming death by experiencing Christ as the red heifer. This was actually his meeting today. But, of course, many of you know his flight was delayed, and so he's not coming in until tonight. So tomorrow night, he'll get to get into more details regarding the details of the matter of the ashes of the red heifer. Right. This is very important, brothers and sisters. Yeah, he's going to have overcome jet lag too, right? He's going to land this afternoon and then tomorrow evening, right? Yeah. Right, but, I, but what we wanted to do this morning was to give you just an impression and how serious death is. This is the, as, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, it says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. death. And we prayed over those verses there in Revelation chapter, four, uh, chapter 1, verse 14. It says, who has the keys of Hades and death? The Lord Jesus Christ as our great high priest. He has the keys of Hades and of death. Right? And at the end of Revelation chapter 20, Hades and death will be cast into the lake of fire. This is the last enemy. And this is the last major hindrance that prevents all of us from reaching the goal. Okay, so this is an important matter. And so we at least wanted to give you an understanding and an appreciation of why we need Christ as the ashes of the red heifer. Because death still lingers in us. And how do you know? Well, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 2, we like the latter part of Ephesians chapter 2 because it's talking about God's great love and mercy. But what we don't see, or what we should see, is the first three verses. It says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by the nature children of wrath, just as the others. Right? So this tells us the condition of death for us. And if we still have any of this description still lingering within our hearts, then we should be on alert to realize, ah, this is another lingering effect of death within my heart. Lord, I want to repent. I want to turn. I want to be purified by you as the reality of the ashes of the red heifer. And of course, then the Lord as the resurrection life. Right? Because how can we overcome? <laughs> if we are dead, how can we overcome? We need life. Right? For Lazarus to overcome, to come out of death, he needed Christ as the resurrection life. Right? So that's the kind of power we should be experiencing in reality. <laughs> Not just in knowledge. Now it needs to become our experience. Right? If, how many of you sometimes feel powerless in practicing the priesthood? Yeah, right? We know what we should do, but there's no energy to do it. 
And then that is what? That's actually then death. The one last verse, I'll, and then I'll end it here, because this is, this is the connecting f- verses of what we're talking about, of the ashes of the red heifer and death. So if, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13 and 14. And let's read this together. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Right, so the connection here, right? In verse 13, not only is there mention of the blood, but there's also what? The ashes of a heifer. And this ashes of the heifer is in reference to the ashes of the red heifer in Numbers 19. And this is for the purifying, right? To cleanse our conscience from dead works. I don't think that we're not subject to dead works. If we go back to Revelation, the first three chapters, the church in Sardis was what kind of a church? A dead church. We have the danger of going through the mechanics of the priesthood and do it in a dead way. This is why we need to be purified from death. That when we serve the Lord, we are not just doing it in dead works, but we are serving with the resurrection life of Christ to serve our living God. So praise the Lord. May we now have a sense and a discernment of what is death and why it's so important for us to recognize it because we need to overcome death. But it's not by our own energy because a dead man can't do anything except be buried. (laughs) Praise the Lord, we've been buried with Christ in our baptism. But we have to come out of the water to walk in newness of life with his resurrection life. To be purified by him, by the ashes of the red heifer, but then to be strengthened, energized, and to live by his resurrection life. And by doing this, then the Lord will bring us all the way to the goal. To be fully qualified to be kings and priests for his coming millennial kingdom age. Amen.